This season of So Now I've Got Breast Cancer is proudly sponsored by Breast Friends CIC. They're your go-to for connecting with others who totally get what it's like to face breast cancer. Whether you're seeking support or just a friendly chat, they've got you covered. Check them out at breastfriends.co.uk and see what they're all about. How do you keep going when your world falls apart? Can you make a difference and turn a bad thing into a good one? And is it possible to get your fitness back when treatment ends? Today's show is all about resilience with a very special guest, the Olympian Donna Fraser OBE. This is So Now I've Got Breast Cancer, the podcast for anyone who's just been diagnosed. I'm Dr. Liz O'Riordan, the breast surgeon with breast cancer, and I find out the hard way just how little I knew when I suddenly found myself in the chemo chair. It's why I wrote my book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer. There's a lot of bad information out there, and I want to guide you down the right path. So if you've got a question, this show will answer it for you. So today I am thrilled to be talking to Donna Fraser OBE. She's a quadruple Olympian sprinter who got the OBE for her services to equality, inclusion and diversity in the workplace. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2009 while she was still a professional athlete and she's a proud ambassador for the charity Breast Cancer Now and I am hugely fangirling. I can't believe I'm actually talking to you. Now she's currently joining us from a holiday in the Caribbean so thank you very much and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. I know it's been a long time coming, but thank you for having me. We've got here in the end. And so many of my followers want to hear your story. One, one woman said, I can't wait to hear the survival story of this warrior just sending you huge amounts of love. So let's start with the beginning about your story with breast cancer. How old were you and how were you diagnosed? I was 36 years old in, I would say, the, the height of my athletic career I mean I was quite old um, in athletics terms but I was really looking forward to the up and coming season in 2009 and the May of that year I found a lump in my breast and to be quite honest you know as athletes we're quite body aware when things are not quite right but I put it down to hard training I thought it was the hard training I was doing lifting a lot of heavy weights getting ready coming out of the outdoor indoor season ready for the outdoors and I just kept an eye on it, kept to all the uh, advice that you're given, you know, keep an eye on it, see if there's any change. And there wasn't that much change. It was literally the size of a garden pea. Um, so I went to my GP and my GP was hugely supportive of my athletic career. So well, regardless, that needs to be removed, but we need to check it out. Um, and of course, because I'm an athlete to get you back on the track as quickly as possible. Um, so I went off, had that biopsy done. Um, I had a lump pectomy as well to, to remove the lump uh, alongside the biopsy. And then lo and behold, when the results came back, um, I was diagnosed with, with uh, early stages of breast cancer, which completely blew me away. I wasn't, I, uh, that was the last thing I was thinking about in all honesty with no family history. I was as fit yeah. as I possibly could be. Um, and as they say, yep. cancer doesn't discriminate. No, it doesn't, does it? And how do they decide what treatment to give you, given that you were heading into your athletic career in the summer? Yeah, that, that was another curveball, in all honesty, because uh, the plan was to go for intense radiotherapy. And when I worked for my appointment uh, with the professor, I was presented with the, the question, have you considered a mastectomy? And I was like, where did that come from you know I'd not really well, even thought about that at all but his rationale was very much that with the age that I was it would potentially come back as secondary so go away and think about it and it was a big decision to make um, but I asked myself many many times you know what do you want to do but then consulting my family my friends and each and every one of them said Donna it's your body you have to make that final yeah. decision and it, it was at the time it was tough, but you know, in hindsight, I just think you know it was literally. Come on, Donna. The question I gave myself was, do you want to live or die? Do you want to keep worrying yeah. year and year, year after year, think you know has it come back? So I just went for the mastectomy. So December the first, two thousand and nine. So it was that length of time within that year 
I had a mastectomy and it, it, it was a tough decision to make and it was a tough few months that followed um, in terms of recovery mentally and physically. Um, however, having said that, I thought I'm still me, I'm still Donna, I'm still Donna Fraser. There's a little bad bit of, bit of me that's been taken away. Yes, it is part of me as a woman. But who will know unless I tell my story? And that's how I got involved with breast cancer now. That's incredible. And thank you so much for sharing it. Did you have the mastectomy to avoid radiotherapy or did you have the radiotherapy and the mastectomy came later? I don't think it was the case of avoidance. Um, I did need radiotherapy after um, because they, they were yeah. comfortable that everything was removed and it was contained. It was just really looking after myself and that was the challenge. Um, as I said, mentally and physically was, was more of a challenge than going through that process of the diagnosis and, and the operation. Um, but yeah, I look back now and sometimes have a bit of an outer body experience that was that me, like even this conversation now talking about it, it's like, oh my gosh, that was me all those years ago. So, um, I have to step back into me again and think, okay, it was me. And you, you come through at the other end and, and it's down to hopefully inspire other women to just check themselves. It, it sounds really simple, but just be body aware. No, it's not. And again, it doesn't seem real when you're this far down the line. For, for me, in the same, it is talking about something else. Did you need any other treatment like hormone therapy afterwards? No. And, you know, I've met so many women who have gone through their different breast cancer journeys. And I will always say I feel I'm one of the lucky ones that I caught it early enough to be able to manage it. I had the mastectomy. I didn't need any medication apart from obviously the yeah. usual stuff after an operation. Um, but I, I do count myself one of the lucky ones because I know some of the journeys have been horrendous. Roller coaster journeys. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I do think every everyone's journey ha is different. And how you deal with it will be different. But I do think we have that common commonality that we're going through some kind of journey. And hopefully some of my words can help people's mindset. I'm sure they will. And so many people have been blown away by how as an athlete, you were diagnosed with breast cancer and you still carried on training and trying to get the fitness back. How hard was that for you? Yeah, that that I, I look back and I remember after the lumpectomy, I, I was racing. I went to Switzerland to compete and I had all the strapping on and I did a hundred meters, which you can imagine the power to come out of the starting blocks and the agony I was in. Oh my goodness. But I hadn't told anyone you see either. So no one knew. Really? What I, no, no one in the athletics family knew what was oh. happening. My, only my close immediate family knew what was happening. And I just had to contain that pain. I did tell my coach that that's a lie. I didn't tell my coach and, you know, he was, bless his heart he, he passed away but he said oh don't worry about it. everything will be fine so he was always so positive around me just focus on your training sessions and look forward and and that's what I did so having positive people around me really just helped me through that um but then of course I made the decision to retire because of the diagnosis at the end of the year and it was almost like a light bulb moment yes I love my athletics and and it's been my world for so many years however this is another part of my life that I feel that I can give something back to others who have gone through this journey. So it was another calling. So that was part of my yeah. therapy, in all honesty, is thinking the what next um, mentally and, and what else can I give back that is positive to others. And I can't imagine what it's like to be forced to give up your career. Well, I can. It happened to me. But because of a breast cancer diagnosis, you were suddenly no longer Donna Lewis, the sprinter. Yeah. And how did it feel thinking, what am I going to do now? Who am I when I'm not this amazing Olympian athlete? Oh, absolutely. I, well, my, luckily, I've had my parents to keep me well grounded. So alongside my athletics career, I did have a working career, uh, which people are surprised by. How did you manage two jobs and juggle the two? But I was very, very lucky to have a great employer, EDF Energy who sponsored me through my athletics career. So I was able to work part-time and do my athletics. So when I finished my athletics, it was a part of me that was taken away. But at the same time, I knew I had that career business side yeah. in me as well. But at the same time, saying goodbye, um, not by choice, was was really tough. 
hence why I came out of retirement in 2012 because the Olympic Games were, were going to be in London. And I thought, well, I'm going to give it a go. I knew it was a long shot, four years down the line, you know, it's, it's a big ask. But um, let me try and then at least I can hang up my spikes on my terms because I'm ready to yeah. rather than because of the diagnosis. So it was a little bit of a it's a sweet feeling but yeah I'm giving something up but I can now I could now close that chapter in 2012 and say yeah that's me done and and competing at the trials in 2012 oh my goodness that was the morning that I told my story to the world of what why really? I come yeah because no one was like Donna why are you training again you know you retired in 2009 why are you coming back and I'm like no I just want to give it another go 2012 I just use that as an excuse um, and then the, the newspaper broke the story that morning of the trials of our heats of the 400. And oh my goodness, Liz, I was on the line and I've got a standing ovation when they read out my name and I was, I was in tears on the starting yeah. line. It was like, this is ridiculous. How on earth am I going to run 400 oh. meters? But of course I didn't qualify, but it was so fulfilling knowing that A, I had huge support in the crowd and B, that I could now hang up my spikes on my terms. It's it's just an incredible story. And I think you've inspired so many people that you can get fitter and stronger again after a breast cancer diagnosis. It doesn't mean the end of all of that. But some of our listeners have asked, how did you find resilience at that time back in 2009? How did you find the strength to wake up and carry on when all of this is happening to you? There are a number of things, Liz, um, and I mentioned one already, my support network, um, my family and friends. Everyone knows me as Donna the Strong One um, that keep bouncing back and even in athletics, gosh, when are you going to retire, Donna? You just keep coming back injury <laughs> after injury and for goodness sake. And because I had that self-belief that, you know, we were all given a life for a reason and just making use of that every minute, every hour, every day, every year that we have to so making the most of that day. And I'm also a, a, a huge advocate of positive affirmations. So if you look on some of my, my social media, I'll put positive quotes up and we all have bad days. Don't get me wrong. I'm not superhuman. Oh, yes. You know, I'll get up in the morning. And think, oh, yeah. Gosh, I've got to go to work. And I think, no, actually, let, let's flip that coin. This is going to be a great day. You're going to make it good. We are in control of our own destiny. Yes, there will be bad things that happen and unfortunate things. Just deal with them and control the controllables. So I think over a period of time, I have built that resilience through sport. I think my athletics has helped me do that uh, and put in that into context. If you have a bad race on Monday, you have to get up on Tuesday and race again and give it your all. So you can't dwell too yeah. much on what happened on that Monday. So I do think that mindset of being a, an athlete, not necessarily a professional athlete, just someone who does something for, for fitness and the, the endorphins and all of that really does make a difference. And apparently, so my parents say to me as a child, if Donna wanted to do something, don't stand in her way. So I, I was quite determined as a child and, and, and that followed through to my primary school where my teachers would always say, be determined. And those words have stuck with me. And ironically one of those values in the olympic the olympic values is be determination so that it seems yeah. that's followed me through through my life no matter what age i am it, it stuck with me i love that and i think what you said you have the power to wake up every morning and decide what that day is going to be like how you're going to start it you can say i'm going to be excited that it's tuesday and i get to race again and it's hard to do at times but just that inner belief that you do have the power to control what happens, I think is such an powerful message. 100%. Now, lots of our listeners have asked about fatigue. Um, on Twitter, I've got Life Lemons and Melons and The Beagle who've said, how did your athletics and your fitness help you cope with fatigue that was happening after the mastectomy, trying to get your recovery back? Did you ever have that, ever thought that you would never get back there again? Oh, absolutely. You know, again, I'm human. We have those thoughts. It's natural. Um, but I do believe that if you know your body, you know what you can do. And it's learning to listen to your body. And fatigue yeah. will set in, absolutely. But I'm not then going to say Donna of old would have just kept going and kept going and kept going. But you can't do that because you're just going to run out of energy and 
to set yourself back 10 million steps rather than going forward. So I think the key thing is listening to your body. You know your body better than anybody else. And and hence why I always say to, to women who, if they find a lump or they don't feel something, it's like, go and get it checked out because yeah. you know your body better than anybody else. You know when your body is the best it can be, 100%, and you know when it's 50%. And if it's 50%, go and have a nap. Go and have some time out. Go and go for afternoon tea. Go and have some fun. Just have that time out and just re-energize. Uh, and I think that that's yeah. what's helped me in terms of re-energizing and thinking time. Go for a walk. Whatever it takes that you know works for you, it, it's just listening to your body. It's brilliant advice. We have to check. And I, our hands up, I never check my breasts. And I don't know whether you did regularly. You kind of mentioned as an athlete, you were very aware. I never did. It's never going to happen to me. And I think so many of us, we bury our head in the sand. We're scared of what we might find. I think it's the same with training. You're scared of pushing yourself, of knowing how fast or how fit or how strong you can be. And it's easy to be in this comfortable bubble. But one of my followers, um, Vix Wheels, said, um, she's so glad I'm talking to you. She found it really hard to talk about cycling to her oncologists. Now, she rides 150 miles a week and she has done for 10 years. And when she mentions it, they think she's strained. She's doing too much cycling. You know, don't do not do that. It's too much. Did you ever come across resistance? Like you shouldn't get back to training. You shouldn't try and make the Olympics. You've had breast cancer. Or were your team really supportive? Oh, I never had that. Um, I think that comes with trust. And with your listener there, your oncologist has the expertise in their field. But you have the expertise in your own self. And you've been doing that. You will... You have to be sensible. Let, let's, you know, let's break this down. If 150 miles a week or day, whatever that listener is doing, is is a struggle, then they will know that this is too much. And it's being sensible. It, it's thinking about the next day as well. If you overdo it, you will know. So, of course, the oncologist wants to give you as much positive advice. But at the same time, you know yourself and not go overboard because then of course you'll go into burnout and I've mentioned that already you'll take 10 steps back rather than forward so it's being sensible so I appreciate uh, the oncologist wants to give the right advice but at the same time your listener knows how much they can do. Thank you for saying that this brings me to the next thing I want to talk to you about do a lot of doctors aren't athletes. A lot of doctors don't do any exercise. I did very little. I didn't have the time. I did not know when I was treating women the evidence that shows you should be getting fit and fast and strong and training hard and working hard, even during chemotherapy. And I didn't tell my oncologist I was swimming and training for triathlons during chemo because I thought she'd tell me off. And I feel awful for saying that. And I'm so glad the world is changing because you and I both work with the amazing girls at Her Spirit to try and encourage women to get active. Can you tell us about that and how sport has helped you and how you think it can help others? Oh, Her Spirit is just such a, a fantastic charity. Um, I got involved, you know, just by chance. And I just think and said, you know, my my calling every morning is if I can inspire one individual, then my job is done. And the work that Her Spirit do is to encourage more women to be physically active. And and I really emphasize the physically active because what is physically active to you, Liz, and physically active to me will be completely different things. And that's the difference. And I often, when I'm doing my, my fitness training, say, oh my gosh, God, Miss Don, I don't want to train like an Olympian. No, this is not about me. Forget that. I'm, a, I'm an Olympian and I've been to the Olympics. I am not going to train you like an Olympian. I'm going to give you an insight of what we've done, but what can you do as an individual? Yeah. And that's exactly what Her Spirit has really captured that, that market where there's something for everyone, whether it's walking, whether it's swimming. And just to see the progress and the community that Her Spirit have, has pulled together, they're helping each other. You know, her spirit's work's done almost because the community are, are helping each other. And there's people like me. It, that's what the individuals will look at her spirit and say, there's someone like me. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's not this yeah. fit, muscly person. No, it's someone who may be a size 18, size 20, who's going for a walk. Whatever, small, slim, wide, whatever it is, individuals are there to do something for themselves. And I think that's the key point. 
It's a brilliant charity created by two amazing women called Holly and Mel. And I'll put the links to that in the show notes. It's it's just great at you're not alone. And when you exercise with others, it kind of keeps you going. Now, out of interest, what training are you doing at the minute, Donna? Because I'm sure you're not still training for the 400 meters. I'm certainly not. So I do circuits every morning. I belong to a WhatsApp group of girls in athletics from different events. So there's shot putters, there's long jumpers. Again, not from my event. And, and we're doing a month's challenge. So we've just done August, a little bit of a circuit and just build up through that. And again, it's that, that community support. Every morning we'll log in and say, yes, it's done. And that inspires us to do it the next. And in fact, I have 34 steps up to our house here in the Caribbean. So I do my steps every other morning here, which is pretty tough in this heat. So I had to do it first thing out of the way. So it's not to the level that I was doing. Absolutely not, because... I think if I did, I'll be striving to be how I was and I don't want to put any pressure on myself. So I'm doing what I enjoy and know that I'm doing something. It's better to do something rather than nothing. I couldn't agree more. And you don't need a gym to stay fit. No. So I wondered how have your priorities and goals changed since you went through treatment all those years ago? They changed immediately. And I, you know, I mentioned the, the challenge came post-surgery um and th this is a story that i often tell my cousin was getting married for january of 2010 and that was my goal she put me in charge of organizing everything and in fact she forgot that i'd just come out of surgery so she was like yeah no. do this do that um and i just got on and did it but that was my focus but you know liz the hardest thing because we went to a spa after the wedding the hardest thing was putting on a bikini and yeah you know as an athlete who where i've run in next to nothing in front of thousands of thousands of people that was the scariest moment I'd, I'd ever experienced yeah and my sister was saying to me John you know no one notices because I still had the valve in and that was sticking out because I, I was quite you know I didn't have much uh much fat on me and so you had a, an, an implant an expander yes. at that time yes yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah and I still have my implant in now and, and the, um, the valve's still there, which I can't feel so much because I've put on a little bit of weight since then. Um, but again, that's another story in terms of, you know, I was offered whether I wanted it removed and, oh, sometimes they can snap. I'm like, you know what, leave it. I don't want to touch anything. If, you know, it's not broken, don't fix it. So that's still there. So that's yeah. often a reminder of what I've gone through um, to see me touching it now. Um, but yeah, that, that was definitely a challenge in terms of, understanding the new me if that makes sense that although yep. walking down the street no one would know that I'd had a mastectomy but I knew I'd had a mastectomy and yeah. I thought everyone was looking at me and I said no Donna come on sort yourself out I uh, and you know I again I talk about my alter ego Diane who has slapped me a few times when there's that self-doubt and, and and she always props up now and again when when I start doubting myself and questioning and and she said, come on, Donnie, you know, you're still you that don't overanalyze too much. Just be you. Uh, and, and we're talking to Donna right now. <laughs> Let's not get it twisted. Um, and, you know, it, it was that was a turning point. Hence why I got involved with the then Breakthrough Breast Cancer was how can I help share my story as an Olympian, as a, a person who had no family history, help people be more body aware stay in fitness and be inspired and have that positive mindset and and that was the turning point for me where I thought you know what this is my calling now where I can make a difference and that's come through all the way through this chat that you just want to use this to help people and you're now a proud ambassador for breast cancer now aren't you what do you do with them Oh, so many things. I've been to, well, I've done many challenges for them. Oh, my goodness. Jumped out of a plane, done the marathon, done walks, all sorts of things. But um, fundamentally, if they need someone to tell the sto their story and, and just inspire others and different campaigns, for example, we know that around screening, especially with ethnic uh, yeah. minorities, there's not many people from ethnically diverse communities who are going for the screening which is fearful, I understand that, but it's there for a purpose. Uh, and campaigns such as those is just to encourage people not to be afraid 
go for the screening because it's better you know and get it caught early yeah. than waiting too late. So those are the things that I will get involved in. Um, yeah, they 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 call me up every now and then. Oh, sorry to put out something. You know what? It's absolutely fine. I'm more than happy to help. Yeah, I'll run another marathon. It's fine. <laughs> oh, that, apart from that one. <laughs> how, so, but interestingly, so as a sprinter, so I was I was watching the Olympics and how the swimmers will say, well, how how far they swim in the pool. The guys racing 25 meters compared to the 10k swimmers. As a sprinter, did you ever run more than a mile? We did. Again, my coach is quite eccentric um, and he'd make me run 800 metres sometimes for for endurance, which I absolutely hated. And we did do a lot of over distance training, but the marathon is another ball game. I thought, to be honest, I was quite naive. I was like, okay, 26.2 miles is a long way. But I'm not going at the speed I was at a 400 meter runner. So it shouldn't be too bad. Well, I was completely wrong. So I take my hat off to anyone who runs anything over 5K um, because it is just not only <laughs> grueling on the body, but grueling on the mind, especially as a sprinter. But that's what I love about seeing people like you go out there and do these challenges and show we're human. Not everyone is amazing. We all struggle, but we're doing them to raise awareness, to raise that support. How long did it take you to get back to your pre-cancer fitness after the mastectomy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the operation was December 2009. And as always, after a mastectomy, you're given a sheet of different exercises. And whether this is the right thing to say, but I'm I'm always open and honest. Um, I didn't quite follow it um, simply because again and we've mentioned it that I knew what my body was capable of doing and that wasn't doing anything for me I I was like this this is just not right for me I don't feel that I'm going to heal quick enough so I kind of added a little bit of extra bits to my exercise regime of recovery um so my operation was December January I mentioned my cousin's wedding I was back in two relative, because of course, you know, with the, you know, the movement and everything was quite difficult to jog. So I'd almost jog, walk, jog, walk. But my pain threshold, might I add, is quite high. So although I was in a little bit of agony, I I got through it. But I knew, and I I will add this uh, as as a disclaimer, I knew when I'd done too much. So I had to take that step back. So I would say around the February time, I I started to do more, more, not so much lifting. I didn't do that much lifting, but I had legs. I could do squats. I could do sit-ups. Just modifying the exercises that didn't cause any discomfort, um, but pushing myself that I knew that, okay, I've got to sweat on. I've done something. Because again, I was an athlete, so I would feel that I needed to get a sweat on to know that I'd I'd actually done something worthwhile but again as a disclaimer do what you know you can do and you know when you need to stop but I would say don't be afraid of getting a sweat on ideally the exercise you do should make you sweaty we do need to be working hard enough and that could just be a fast walk for you during chemotherapy but you need to work hard enough to see the benefits. So I love that. I did more than I was told, but that's, again, I knew I needed more for my own mental health. And it's listen to your body, take the advice of your team, but do what you know you need to. Great Definitely. advice. So I know you spent a lot of time since your diagnosis working in equality, diversity and inclusion. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Oh, without a doubt. I think, you know, as me, me as a black woman who's gone through breast cancer, I'm, I'm covering two areas straight away. And, and when we're talking about EDI, um, F, you know, EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, it is about that understanding and coming together and in communities, talking about about breast cancer or any forms of cancer can be quite taboo and Oh no, you know, don't have you know, hang out your dirty laundry, no one needs to know, or not going to screening. It's there's that fear factor, isn't there? So me as an individual who covers both of those identities, it's really important for me to say, no, don't be afraid. It's better that you know you go that the services are there, the support is there. But if you don't access it, then you will never know. So in the work that I do in sport around EDI is really important to me in, in terms of how you treat people. 
uh, and how you are as an individual to make the world a better place. And it sounds really simple and sometimes it is a struggle for people to understand that and how it impacts businesses, it impacts your lives full stop in terms of respecting one another, understanding in terms of, you know, everyone's experiences are different. Even in a breast cancer journey, you know, yours has been different, mine has been different. But understanding that from an oncologist perspective as well, we spoke about one of your listeners. And, and if you don't quite understand other people's journey, you can't put things in place for them and that support. So, so that's where the two kind of come together. And I think it's so important. You don't know what you don't know. And in, in, in the medical field, we used to say there are manuals. You'd go to a conference and just a row of middle-aged white men talking and it's hard enough getting one white woman on the panel let alone people of different backgrounds and I think it's being able to raise awareness and say this isn't on we need to include everybody because we know that outcomes aren't as good in people who come from different races different socioeconomic backgrounds and ideally we want to give everyone the same chance of survival and that's why again thank you so much for doing everything you're doing Thank you. Now, I wanted to ask, as I have got an Olympian on the end of the phone here, (laughs) and thank you very much for taking time away from your holiday. What tips would you have for someone who's listening who struggles just to get off their bum and walk around the park? How do you get your fitness mojo back? How do you make those first steps? Well, Hurstbit already have an app called uh, Give Me Five, which you will hear me in their ear if you want to sign up to that. Um, I've listened and Donna's brilliant. <laughs> I'm not biased, but I think you're great. But carry on. Well, you know what? I, I did it and I thought I like to train people how I like to be trained. You've got to have fun. You really have to have fun with it and understand that everyone will be at different levels. So again, just listening to your body, we will get to that 5K, no matter how long it takes, but you will get there. Um, and having me in your ear, it can be a bit annoying probably to some, but we try and have fun with it. So that's number one. But let, let, let precursor to that, if you're laying in bed, let, let's let's put a scenario on. You're laying in bed, it's seven o'clock in the morning, and you're thinking, oh, you know, it's winter, it's dark outside. Oof, I don't really fancy going out for a walk. But what can I do? Well, I've got a can of beans in my cupboard. I've got two cans of beans in my cupboard. Let me go and get those two cans of beans. Let me go and get them, stand up, do a few squats with the cans of beans in my hand, watching the news, BBC breakfast, whatever it is you watch in the morning or listen to. Let me do a few lunges. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay, let's get lie down and do a few sit-ups, rubbing my knees a little bit. How long was that? 15 minutes or so? 15 minutes of your day doing some basic movement exercises with a can of beans. You don't have to go outside. And you mentioned it already, Liz. You don't need to go to the gym to be active. You can do things, you find things in your own home. You have a chair, doing dips, anything just to get moving. And I really will emphasize the word movement. Movement is just so, so important because your body, as you get older, it will get slower, it will seize up. But movement is just so important. So, just be inspired by a can of beans. <laughs> it is the stuff that I love that. that line. <laughs> it's I know another word is exercise snacking. So I will do squats whilst I'm waiting for the kettle to boil or I'll do push ups against the kitchen counter. You don't need to do thirty minutes in a gym, you can squeeze in, in the day. So I've got washing to go upstairs. I'll take it item by item. So I'm going up and down this it's just those ways of fitting in and you can get fit and strong and get your life back after breast cancer. Definitely. And, and, and you are a huge that. example of that. Oh, and yeah. building on that, because it may go from 15 minutes to 30 minutes to 35, just building at your own pace. What is the rush? You know, there's no rush. And I think yeah. sometimes we, we put so much pressure on ourselves. Okay, well, by the summer, I'm going to have this, you know, summer body. Well, why are you thinking like that? Just take one day at a time, little by little, because then that puts extra pressure on. And then some days you won't feel like doing what you set out to do, but do something. And if you think that way, then it's just shifting that mindset a little bit. I love that. We need to stop comparing ourselves to others, don't we? And just do what we need. Absolutely. And finally, there'll be people listening whose careers have been ending. Their lives have been completely overturned by a breast cancer diagnosis. And you've shown us about resilience and bounds to overhaul your career and start to help people. Have you got any tips for someone who is right in that 
step, they've just been diagnosed, they don't know what to do. How do you find your feet and start to find a new life to lead? Yeah, there are a number of tips. Um, I think the first thing is, is talk. Find someone that you feel comfortable speaking your truth. Because I think often when you've been just diagnosed, you're hearing so much information, your mind is boggled. It's like Spaghetti Junction. You're thinking, oh my goodness, who is there that I can speak to? Who is neutral? Because sometimes you don't want to speak to one of your family member who you are, you might be close to, but you don't want to because do they understand and you feel that no they don't get it and I just find find that neutral person that you can just speak your truth and breast cancer now have those services that you could just yeah. offload and I think that's the first thing because there is so much and asking the questions and your podcast is another example of that a platform where you can ask those questions that they may not feel comfortable asking someone else so talking is the power of conversation, you can't beat it. it, it it's just used. It's an offload for you as an individual. And also you can get some feedback if you ask for it. The second thing that I did is um, writing. Is just writing those yeah. feelings. Keeping almost like a journal. I still keep a journal now. And I think that stemmed from being an athlete. We'd write down our sessions, how we felt, what went wrong, all of the highs and lows. Uh, you know, I look back at them now and just smile at myself. It's like, gosh, is that how I felt that day? But keeping a journal really does help the progress and the healing, A, of the diagnosis, what's to come. Because down the line, when you look back at that and you think, wow, if you're self-doubting and thinking, oh, I'm still in the dumps, you look back and think, gosh, I've come a long way, actually. Because oh, that's how I yeah. felt on that Tuesday. Oh, my goodness. Well, what did I do to overturn that? And that leads into that third part is, you know, just try and I know it's hard and I'm not I said I'm not you superhuman and I know it's hard I've been there if any negativity comes into mind find a positive to counteract that that is just so so important yes I'm feeling rubbish today but okay the sun is shining okay I can go and have a cup of tea something as simple as that some that, that feel good fact to find that one thing that you can overturn that negative do not dwell too long on that negative thought because that will fest and it will eat away at you find something positive that makes you feel good whether it's a positive affirmation a quote whatever listening to your podcast whatever it is that gives you that feel good fact to just find that one thing I love that thank you so much it is all about finding those moments of joy that can flip a day upside down Donna, you are such an inspiration and I could talk to you for hours. I just want to say thank you for sharing your story and being this open and honest and going out there to help women. Say it's not scary. We can treat you. We can look after you. You will come through this. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it. That was four-time Olympian athlete Donna Fraser OBE. She's so inspirational, isn't she? Her positivity and energy just shine out. Now, Donna's found a way to make a difference in the breast cancer community by speaking up for equality and diversity. Not only is October Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but it's also Black History Month. And we all need to do more to make sure that everyone gets the same treatment. My takeaway from our chat is that it's all about having a positive mindset. If you believe you can, you will. The Donna's Olympian training obviously helped her master this, but I think it's something we can all try. And now it's time for our podcast poet, Donna Ashworth, to read a poem from her latest book, Growing Brave. And I'm thrilled that Donna has agreed to come back for season three. And I can't think of a better poem to kick us off. It's called Nesting Dolls. Over to Donna. Nesting Dolls. I think... Every version of the woman we have been lives within us still, like those wooden nesting dolls we played with as children. And truly, we cannot begin to fully love ourselves until we take each one of those dolls out and honour them just as they are. All the mistakes, all the flaws, all the ways in which you thought them disappointing. They were exactly who they were so that you could be you today. And each 
is so beautiful if you are bearing in mind how brave it is to try. As you make peace with these dolls, one by one, be emboldened by the knowledge that the very final shell of this creation, the very final you, will be the you you were supposed to be, having known and loved all of the yous you were supposed to be then, too. That was Donna Ashworth reading the poem Nesting Dolls from her new book, Growing Brave. We are all changing every day. I want you to remember who you were and bring that with you as you face the future. If you want to read more of Donna's poems, find out more about today's guest, Donna Fraser OBE, or any of the issues she raised, or just send me a question to answer on the show. You'll find all the details in the show notes. And before we wrap up, I want to give a final nod to our sponsors, Breast Friends CIC. As I said at the start of the show, they're all about bringing people together, whether you're newly diagnosed or years down the line. If you're looking to connect with others who truly understand, pop over to their website at breastfriends.co.uk and see how they can help. Next week, I'm going to give you some tips to help you deal with the hair thinning that can come from cancer treatment. The wonderful Jasmine Julia Gupta from Cancer Hair Care is back in the studio and she's got some great advice. You know when you draw a flat circle and you shade it in and just with a pencil you make it look like a sphere, hair's like that. A bit of good colour, carefully done and a bit of a haircut can make a huge difference to the textural feel and how hair looks. I'm Dr Liz O'Riordan, thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. So Now I've Got Breast Cancer is produced by Birdline Media.